now that I have your attention, let's talk about death. But first, let's talk, start at the beginning. I remember the first child I saw born. It was amazing. It was also a little bit gross, but it was amazing. This one's me. The first baby that I delivered, it was a woman who had had four children previously. And she walked me through it, and we both did great. She delivered a beautiful baby girl, and I was in awe. I also remember the first person that I saw die. I was introduced and somewhat intrigued by death from a fairly young age. I was never the biggest fan of death, but to say that it taught me nothing would be a lie. My experiences with death come from losing the people I love, many of whom you see here, as well as losing patients and grieving with their families. From my experiences with death, I've written articles for TED Med, I've written for the San Diego Reunion Tribune, and I wrote a children's book. And I did this because I think death is something that should be talked about. I remember the first time I worked to save a person's life. In medicine, to save a life, we use the ABCs. And you thought medicine was difficult. A is for airway. A tube is placed in the patient's mouth, down their throat, into the airway tube called the trachea. This is used to breathe for the patient during a code. At best, after we remove the tube, the patient will have a sore throat. At worst, the patient could lose teeth, aspirate stomach contents into their airway, causing pneumonia, or even have a spasm of their vocal cords, which will completely close their airway. B is for breathing. To breathe for the patient, we connect the tube to a squeezable bag. That bag is used to deliver oxygen during the code, and then after the code, the patient can be placed on a ventilator. A ventilator is a machine that breathes for the patient. This could technically be done indefinitely. Ventilators are often associated with pneumonia as well as lung injury. C is for compression. Compressions are done on the patient's chest in order to course blood through the heart and lungs and deliver oxygenated blood to the brain, vital organs, and the heart itself. In doing these comp compressions, we can often break patients' ribs, damage their lungs and other surrounding structures. Also part of circulation are lines that are placed in pa uh, the patient's limbs as well as their neck and sometimes even their bone. These lines are used to deliver fluid, blood, and also special medications that centralize blood flow and cause the patient's heart to beat rapidly. The last part of circulation are defibrillator pads that can be placed on patient's chest. The defibrillator pads can send electricity through the heart in an attempt to reset the electrical system. This is kind of like trying to reboot a computer. A resuscitation or saving a life is not a peaceful resurrection. It's a resuscitation. It's a violent fight against death. It's a last stand and a push to the brink of exhaustion for everyone involved in hopes that beneath the broken body surface still lies a person. Doctors do not resurrect, we resuscitate. My first, resurrect, uh, my first resuscitation happened in my first month as a UCSD emergency medicine doctor in the most feared floor on the hospital, the intensive care unit, or ICU. The ICU takes care of the sickest, most medically complex patients in the entire hospital. The nursing staff are highly skilled, highly qualified nurses that often work one-to-one -one with patients in order to deliver near constant care. These are some of our wonderful I, uh, ICU nurses at UCSD who saved my butt several times that month. Uh, when I first walked on the floor in the ICU, I was a bright-eyed, bushy-tailed doctor, and I was pretty excited. I quickly realized that many of my patients were dying, and they weren't gonna die at home surrounded by the ones they loved. They were gonna die in medical facilities surrounded by healthcare professionals. Is this what we want? If you could choose how you will die, surely you would choose at home in the comfort of your own bed instead of in a hospital surrounded by medical professionals. Moreover, every room had more machines than patients and humanity was completely lost among science and technology. So why is this happening? Could it be that we're not talking about death and that is why patients are dying in hospitals? 
In the ICU each year, 4 million people are entering with a mortality rate of between 8 and 19 percent. 500 million people, 500,000 people are dying in the ICU every year. Of the patients that survive, 20 percent of them have post-traumatic stress disorder at one year follow-up. Even more than that, 715,000 people are dying in the U.S. each year. So why is this happening? Could it be because we're not talking about death? When I was in medical school, my father called me to talk about my mother's wishes to become do not intubate, do not resuscitate. When my mom died, she died in peace and she was surrounded by the ones that she loved. My mother was my best friend and the single most important person in my life. When we made the decision to allow her struggle to end, the choice was clear because she had made her wishes in these circumstances clear. If I'm going to go, let me go in peace. She took the burden of decision-making off the ones she loved, and she gave doctors a clear path. So when the time came, we carried the burden of suffering and allowed her peace. So we're discussing death, and it makes a difference. And this is an enlightened movement that's happening all over the world. Death cafes and death salons are opening solely for the purpose of people discussing death, such as this death cafe that's located in San Diego. Michael Ebb came up with the concept of the death dinner. You invite all your friends and family over to discuss death over dinner. Also, people are writing books about death, like Atul Gawande's Being Mortal, and Goodnight Grandma Angel, a children's book by a lesser known author, illustrator duo, Me and My Mother. A group of people who have always discussed death is doctors. For better or worse, we were confronted with our mortality early and often. And it's difficult. I remember recently I was at lunch with a friend of mine and in the hospital, she's a different type of physician, she's an internal medicine doctor, and she said that a patient had died that morning and her heart felt heavy. She didn't really want to eat lunch. Even in our very different careers, we had both very early been forced to confront death. It's difficult every time. It's even more difficult for doctors to learn not to blame themselves. We have many sleepless nights. We consider changing careers. Some people even do. I think at this point in time, we should reframe the role of a healthcare professional in end-of-life care. We should come together and talk about death. At this point, end-of-life care is a black box that needs to be opened. We need to bring death into the light in order, we can, in order to give life the respect that it deserves. You know this, if I, were gonna if I told you you were going to die tomorrow, instantaneously each moment of your life would become infinitely more precious. Why is that? It's the same life that you're living right now. So what should we do? Appreciate what you have. Love the ones around you. Come together to talk about your hopes and your dreams. And talk about if someone you love is to leave before you, how you can honor them if they'll go. Discuss death. Because I think that death can change your life. Thank you.